So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce this next session, which is going to be uh, our session one on fisheries. And uh, I'm going to be moderating this session, and uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, Ben Coop from the University of Victoria, who's going to be talking about the international cooperation to uh, sequence the Atlantic salmon uh, genome. And uh, give us an update on that, and uh, that'll be followed then by Christy Miller, who's from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, who's going to be telling us about health risks uh, in microbes in BC's Pacific wild salmon. So um, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, uh, Ben Coop to the stage. Well, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, in these days of a thousand genomes of this and a thousand genomes of that, this is going to be a story of one genome. The challenges of this genome require a tremendous amount of fundamental and basic research. So that basic research has already led to a number of innovations and practical application. But it is also that basic research effort that allows me, as an individual, to straddle two very opposing user groups, as you all know. So this is the Atlantic Salmon Genome and, and its efforts. There's an international group from Chile, uh, Norway, and Canada. And its goal is to basically identify and map all of the genes of the Atlantic Salmon. And more importantly, act as a reference or guide sequence for some of the other different salmonids. And I'm going to go through some of the basic ideas of the project. First of all, fish. Most people are in health, but to give an idea of fisheries in general. This is a relationship of teleosts. Teleosts occupy 60% of all vertebrates. The difference between some of the different groups are older than birds and mammals, by quite a bit. It's an incredibly diverse group, so one fish, all fish are not the same. Here at the top you see some of the different perch, fugu, uh, madaka, and some of the catfish or uh, codfish, and down here some of the salmonids. This group at the basal group of eutelios, the true fishes, um, at, this is the oldest true fish group, and it separates from most of the other fish by about 300 million years. Uh, these numbers here indicate the number of species along some of these lineages. A tremendous amount of diversity. Some of the, these numbers indicate nucleotide sequences for some of the different uh, representatives, as well as some of the ESTs that are no, known in GenBank and some pretty pictures of some of the different fishes involved. So this gives you an overview of fishes and the relationships uh, that we're working with. What about salmonids? Well, this is kind of my fishes in a nutshell slide, and it's why it's so busy. And what we've done is just what's known. This is the background slide. What's known about fishes? And so I just counted all of the papers that are that have been published since 1955 on fish, and that's salmonids, the different groups along the to uh, the top, and the, the total number of publications plus some of the different areas that you can see. And you can see of all of the different uh, publications, close to 50% of total publications in fisheries are in salmonids. So roughly we have a tremendous amount of information about all of these different categories of salmonids. And as you'll see, very little about some of the genetics. That ranks fairly low. And as you can see, uh, Fisheries and food fisheries are really low represented in zebrafish, stickleback, etc. But they're also very important in understanding things like toxicology, ecology, uh, immunology, and development. So zebrafish, a lot of the emphasis on development. But the point here is that there's a tremendous amount of information on this. And it's important to include this information or incorporate this information in our studies and how it can be applied to basic genomic research. The biology of salmonids, we're all very familiar with, many of it, 
But one of the more important things is that there is a whole genome duplication, and I'll mention that a little bit more in a minute. There is the uh, salt water, fresh water, uh, life cycle changes that are they're homing to natal rivers that go across huge amounts of, of distance and find their way back to the same uh, uh, gravel bed that they were born in. This is a tremendous, it's a, it's, it's a tremendous issue in biology, something that's uh, captivated our imagination for a number of years. Things like sex determination, uh, the immune system, how you deal with the, with the pathogens in an environment of salt water and fresh water, handling stress and metabolism, lots of different uh, problems and issues that are part of our uh, understanding of the biology of some ones. To give you just an idea of what salmonids look like, there are about 68 different species of salmonids. We have uh, the Atlantic group, represented by Atlantic and brown trout, the Pacific group of salmonids, the char, grayling, arctic whitefish, and these are together, as you'll see in a moment, at the non-coding sequence level, about 93% similar. So clearly, if we're looking at one representatives, we have a pretty decent handle on some of the others as well. So we have uh, this cross uh, comparison to, be, to draw from. This diamond here represents a whole genome duplication in the ancestor of salmonids. Um, the closest ancestor that is, has not undergone this whole genome duplication is the northern pike or esox and that is a diploid uh, non-duplicated and that will be important as we'll come to it in a bit. So about 68 different species of salmonids all very closely related all with this salmon this, this genome duplication and almost all of which are important commercially or for fisheries reasons or uh, conservation efforts. So what about this genome duplication? It's a problem that we have to deal, on, to deal with. And what is in, what's involved? Well, essentially you're going from a 2N species to a 4N species. At that point, we have a crisis in the genome. That is, that is temporarily stable but very quickly it becomes unstable and in order to produce fertile gametes you have to go undergo this re-diploidization process that is getting back to a stable genome where when you go through meiosis and mitosis you get chromosomes going to the right, right poles all of the gene you get a, a decent uh, a, a full complement of genes for each for each, each, each of the gonads or each of the, the uh, sperm and eggs. And that's an incredible process. It's a difficult process. And salmon are, are one of the few species that have survived, vertebrates that have survived this. So you go from a 2N of 48 acrocentric chromosomes to double that to 96 acrocentric chromosomes and then there's a whole bunch of rearrangements and you can see some of the different, the different uh, chromosome numbers and fundamental numbers that are involved. Now this duplication and redeploidization causes lots of problems. There's dosage effects. Um, you have to be able to restabilize a whole, a whole pathways and, and ontologies. What do you do with sex when you get two different sex, from sex genes that are involved? How do you deal with some of those issues? And then what happens and how does it drive? What, is, what drives this and how does what happens with speciation? And are there similar mechanisms? So there's lots of issues that's involved in the fundamental biology of salmonids. So this will be, or we expect it to be the first, it is the first tetra or polyploid vertebrate species sequenced. First of all, we built a map, and this is going through a little bit of history. Um, just to kind of bring you to up to date with some of the genomic resources that are available through back libraries, built a number of different back libraries together with Bjorn O'Hellion of, of 
Norway, uh, those, many of those bags were, were uh, end sequenced, mapped, fingerprinted at the GSC here. And at the bottom line here, we have approximately 4,000 different contents with at least two backs and about 11-fold coverage of this basic resource, these back clones that represent the genome. Early on, we spent a fair amount of time learning a little bit about that genome, and we targeted a number of different projects. These are some of the different projects that we targeted. Uh, the immune system, which is one of my favorite subjects, is obviously a very uh, important and represented here. So that those duplicates, what we learned about those duplicates is that there's a tremendous amount of, of repeat elements. The bottom line is that almost 60% of the entire genome is repeated elements. Some of the different elements are indicated here. 60%, and so when we took just one class of these elements and did a, a phylogenetic tree indicated here, we show that 95, almost, almost all of those repeated elements are between 90 and 100% similar to one another. So, if we look at the tree involved, this 95% or 99% occurs is common to the spe speciation area here. This duplication area down here, very little happened in terms of transposable elements. So 60% of the genome is this highly mobile transposable elements. There's lots of different families, there's bursts of activity, there's individual species, all with unique repeat families, there's major families that we use for genome reconstruction, there's patterns, and also tremendous evidence for horizontal transfer, which I won't go into. The bottom line is that we have a highly unstable genome, and it continues to be unstable, because largely because of these elements. We've, un we've uh, spent a fair amount of time to identify genes, and I won't go through it in the different species. I won't go through it, but now we now have uh, between 50 and 90,000 different uh, genes known for, uh, for Atlantic salmon. These genes have been used in a number of different applications, micro -app applications, over 300 different applications have been, uh, have used these these microarrays to study a whole range of things from disease to conservation to environment. We've also been used, these, these sequences have also been used to identify a, 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 a SNP chip. Initially, it was because of the duplication, it was difficult to build. It was about 6,500 different uh, uh, elements on it. But even with this, we was allowed us to build a fairly dense genetic map and also to demonstrate that the genes, in fact, this genome, in fact, is a duplication. You can see this is stickleback chromosomes and some of the different salmon chromosomes. You can see, for, for example, stickleback chromosome uh, 20 is represented by chromosome 2 and chromosome 5, another thing, salmon. Uh, 19 is this here by uh, 10 and uh, 15. And you see the primary uh, pattern 13, two different chromosomes. This pretty much demonstrates that, in fact, many of the genes are duplicated, su supporting this genome duplication. SNPs have been used to identify uh, a genetic structure in a number of different. I've just used this as an example, Louis Vernatchez's uh, uh, studies that have used. Uh, SNP chips to confirm basically different patterns, geographic patterns in some of the different populations of Atlantic sand, <clears throat> and also to identify SNPs that are associated with things like temperature, uh, uh, local adaptations, distance, and, and other uh, phenotypes that are under selection. So these applications for population studies, uh, aquaculture stocks, for health, Many of these SNPs are already under uh, investigation and some are being used to select for specific socks uh, for breeding. 
<laughs> More importantly, now there is a, 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 a 1 billion SNP chip that is currently being tested and that will be used extensively in the coming uh, number of years. But what we really need is a reference. We have a lot of data, we have a lot of background information, but we really need a, a single common reference. And for that, we decided on a multiple phase uh, uh, strategy. The first phase was a, a traditional Sanger sequencing. Remember, this is a diploid or a tetraploid genome with lots of repeats in it. And so we did, this is probably the last genome you will see that includes Sanger sequencing and it's been invaluable. The second phase has in, is, is incorporated next generation sequencing and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. This is a summary slide of what we have for the genome sequence at the present time. Phase one was mostly Sanger sequencing with a little bit of uh, Lumina sequencing and the bottom line is the Contig N50 that is where 50% of the largest contigs uh, occupy 50% of the genome. And you'll see that the large, the at number is about 11.8 kb after phase one. And even after a tremendous amount of effort in phase two, that is only increased by a small amount. So, however, what we have gained from, it, from this additional data has been a very large increase from 152 kb uh, scaffold to 1.2 million. And this is, this is a reaching our goal. This is still quite a bit short. More importantly, we've included uh, the, the pipe and some of the efforts in, in, in my lab in, in looking at the, that non-duplicated species genome for comparisons. So we've come a long ways, we've, in, we've had a lot of problems, and as you can imagine, most of those problems come from those repeats. Those repeats are one and a half to five kilobases, 99% somewhere, spread right throughout the genome. And this is part of the issues, this is why we need to spend so much time working through this. For that, in order to resolve that, Sanger has been invaluable in helping get through this. The Illumina has been very helpful to build just the overall bulk of the genome and now we're trying to resolve this issue of these repeats. For that, we've initiated a, a, uh, a test with uh, Beijing Genome Institute where we're going to look at 24,000 individual bats to be sequenced. And that testing is currently underway to see how that will resolve some of these issues. A second strategy is with uh, uh, using PacBio and reads excessive uh, upwards of 5 to 10 kb to get through some of these very difficult groups. In, in fact, 99% of the genome is there. The problem, it's in, little, it's in small pieces and it's not contiguous. The other potential uh, uh, resolution to this issue is these, this large one um, million SNP chip, element SNP chip. That has the potential to order many of these different contexts, not particularly exactly, but give us a, a general order of many of these different contexts. And so that, as we uh, are entering into the, this next year, these, these basic uh, uh, approaches are being used to resolve some of the issues with what's the same genome. These problems are with all sound monads. The, the issues we're dealing with, the instability of the genome, it, it explains why uh, there's so many things in sound monads that are unexpected, their response to disease, their, uh, the impact of environmental insults, all of these things where you have this uh, highly redundant system that's changing continuously in response to environment, to pathogens, and a number of other things. What we have learned is that there is some structural symmetry, even as far back 
as salmon to Esox, where genes that are, some genes are still next to each other, and some of that is, is still there. We've learned that, and I haven't gone into this, there's a tremendous amount of non-genetic information being exchanged. That is horizontal gene transfer. That is an untapped, or that's a, it's, a, it's really a, a, the elephant in the room, where genes are going back and forth, not only between different salmonic species, but between different fish species, even between invertebrates and, uh, uh, or other vertebrates like uh, uh, salamanders and just as bacteria, that kind of horizontal exchange of genetic information is tremendous. As I said, 60% of this genome are these transposable elements that are mo moving between species and they're carrying other things with them. As part of the genome duplication, I won't go into it, at this point we have the northern pike and the two duplicates of salmon. There's a slow and there's a fast. We've been able to demonstrate that. We've also shown that about 70% of the genes are now pseudogenes. Most of them are still present, but about 70% are no longer expressed. We've also seen that there is a correlation between uh, there is a, there is a relaxed selection where there is two do, two genes. There's certainly a sm somewhat relaxed selective pressure, and there's more that we've learned about that duplication. We've provided a number of different, a lot of different genetic markers to be able to link some of the different phenotypes we see with some monads with specific genes, and this has enabled things like marker-assisted selection a number of vaccine development, though still early. Certainly population structure, real-time fisheries management, as maybe Christy may get, can attest to. Hatchery breeding for climate change and poor environmental change in general, and assessing the health of our environment. The biggest issue is resequencing. Until we get a solid reference that allows us to look at all of the different salmonid species, it, we are really being held back, and that is why we're putting so much effort into this one single species. I want to end very quickly by a, a bit of a thank you. Uh, Cindy might recognize this. That's Cindy a few years ago. <laughs> and a group that got together and saying, what about doing a salmon genome? And of course, everybody thought we were crazy, because who would want to do a polyploid genome? Uh, we had rather modest uh, goals at those in the early years. And more importantly, to thank the uh, funders who really uh, incorporated the vision and have uh, helped with this. You'll see some other familiar people here. Alan, Pierre, and some of the other people that are associated. And without these funders who have really taken hold of this vision and uh, accepted the challenge of this particular genome project. Thank you very much. <laughs>